about certain terms they can and cannot use and shut down conversation based on it. That's why I cited the example from uh, U of M libra uh, librarians over here. Um, you know, only you can say how much that matters to you in your daily life. It's possible that you never experienced that. When I was in college, I didn't experience much of it either. Um, but it has become a pretty major national issue. Uh, and uh, and since, you know, since Trump's election, I think it's going to get worse because now all the snowflakes are melting. And, and again, as somebody who didn't support Donald Trump, it is kind of delicious to watch people uh, just immerse themselves in their own tears. I mean, professors excusing classes because, they, because people didn't like that Trump was elected. Well, listen, folks, I mean, the, the, the security that I work with, both of them fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. I think you can handle the fact the person you didn't want to be elected was elected. I think it'll be okay. I think you'll live. So, you know, I think it's going to get worse, not better, is what I'm saying to you. Um, but as far as your experience, I mean, you'll have to tell me. Yeah, well, it just it seemed like you were kind of generalizing that to yeah. be emblematic of the left in general on campus, and I feel like that's pretty inaccurate. Like, certainly there's some people that think Yeah, that. I, think that's, I think that's true. I think there are a lot of people on the left who don't do that, um, and, and that's great. And, let's, and, and that's why, by the way, I use the term left as opposed to liberal. You notice I don't use the word liberal, right? I don't, I think, I don't think it's actually proper. There's a definitional difference. Liberals actually believe in liberalism, right? They actually still believe in the idea that you should be able to say what you want to say. Jonathan Chait is somebody I disagree with about everything, but Jonathan Chait is somebody who doesn't believe in political correctness or microaggressions or any of this nonsense. Uh, people on the left do, right? That's why I actually I do make a philosophical distinction between the two. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Hi, I'm a huge fan. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, so um, this whole election cycle, everyone kept talking about how um, we should have more than two parties in the U.S. Mm -hmm. What's your thought on that? Uh, we don't need more than two parties, we just need not crappy candidates. Uh, the, 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 problem with the, the, the problem is that the system is sort of built for two parties because it's such a large country and because you need a major infrastructure in order to run a party. There could have been a legit third party this time, but it turns out the libertarians were too busy smoking weed to actually do anything about it. They, uh, the libertarians blew such an unbelievable opportunity in, in this election cycle, and instead they ran Gary Johnson, who if he... I mean, I'm, I'm actually pro-marijuana legalization, but he makes a very strong case against me. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it, what is Aleppo? Uh, but it's, it, but it's, it, 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 there could be a guy, I think that if the Republican Party continues to move in the direction of Trumpism, I do think there will be a third party. Because I think that Trumpism is not conservatism. There's still a lot of constitutional conservatives who are not comfortable with the idea of a big government guy who just really believes in closed borders and tariffs. Uh, and it, it depends who Trump is, right? Trump may govern as a conservative. He may shock me, right? He shocked me in this election. I thought that, that he was going to lose. Uh, obviously, he didn't. Uh, everybody, to be fair, everyone thought he was going to lose, including Trump, right? Everyone thought he was going to lose, except for Bill Mitchell, who's high off his own fumes. But, that, but he was right, so apparently it's good stuff. Um, so, it, you know, it sort of depends on what Trump does. May, I hope he's, he surprised me in winning the election. I hope he surprises me in, in how he governs. I don't think he'll surprise me as a human being, because I think that at 70 years old, uh, unless he has some sort of like Paul on the road to Damascus conversion, uh, he, he's pretty set in his ways. So, thank you. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, what do you think historically? Um, how did Jew hatred arise historically? Mm -hmm. And um, we see it on both sides of the political spectrum in America. Why yeah. do you think that is? Uh, well, there are different types of Jew hatred. So not all types of Jew hatred are exactly the same. So there have really been three main strains of Jew hatred. One is religious Jew hatred, right, which is like old school Christianity during the Crusades, right? The Jews killed Jesus, and now we're going to take him out, right? Or modern radical Islam in the Middle East. The Jews are bad, therefore we're going to murder all of them. Uh, that's, that's one strain of, of anti-Semitism, and that's the most virulent strain, right? Because if you religiously believe you have to do away with the people, it's kind of scary. Uh, and then, there's the, then there's kind of left-wing anti-Semitism, and, uh, and then there's kind of quasi-right-wing <coughs> anti-Semitism. The, the, the left-wing anti-Semitism uh, is based on the premise that, on this Marxist premise, that everybody ought to finish in the same place. So right now, the reason the left has moved against Israel, for example, is Israel is successful, all of its neighbors are not, therefore Israel must have victimized all of its neighbors. And, that is, and that's led to this, this tremendous rise in the idea that Jews are somehow victimizing people, that's why they're so successful, uh, they're, they're too, too successful a group. And that exists uh, on the far left, and unfortunately it's starting to kind of mainstream itself through anti-Israel and anti-Zionism into actual anti-Semitism. Uh, on the right, uh, there's a group of people who believe that Jews are sort of interlopers, 
uh, in Western civilization. This is the alt-right. Uh, and I didn't even believe that this was a thing until this election cycle when I was named by the, uh, the Anti-Defamation League. This year I was named as the number one target of white supremacy in, in the United States as a journalist. Uh, there were something like 20,000 anti-Semitic tweets sent between the beginning of the year and May. I was the personal recipient of 8,000 of them. Uh, and uh, so thir it was like 38% came to me. Uh, and uh, they were like full-on Nazi memes, like she was being shot in the head, um, gas chamber memes with, of course, this was after I, uh, I didn't decide to back Donald Trump. Uh, and, uh, and so that, that does exist on, on wings of the alt-right. The alt-right believes uh, that Western civilization is inherently connected to European race. Uh, which doesn't even make sense because European race predates Western civilization by several tens of thousands of years, right? There are lots of people in Britain before Western civilization came about. Uh, but this belief is that the Jews are sort of, uh, they, they can't be trusted, that biology is inherently connected with culture, which is a bunch of crap, and that Western civilization is a product of Christendom, not a product of, of, of Judeo-Christianity, and so the Jews have to be sort of cast out. Uh, and so th there, there are a bunch of different strains. The reason that it's rising right now uh, in Europe is because, uh, first of all, a lot of it is actually coming from new Muslim immigrants. But second of all, there is that feeling among Europeans. There's also a guilt feeling among a lot of European countries. They're sick of hearing about the Holocaust, and so they're going to try and portray Israel as a new Holocaust state, so they don't have to feel so bad about what happened. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a complex topic, but uh, it is unfortunate that, that anti-Semitism seems to be on the rise again. Thank you. Big fan. <laughs> I've been a huge fan. Oh, thank you. Um, my question has to do with Guantanamo Bay. Mm -hmm. um, some people say that it is unjust to hold these people prisoner since they have not received a fair trial. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand on this topic? Uh, you're not entitled to a fair trial if you are not an American citizen. So, the, so the, the, you know, under the Constitution of the United States, uh, you're not entitled to due process of law. Uh, that is particularly true if you're attempting to kill American soldiers on the battlefield. Uh, they will, in time, be tried. They have been tried by military tribunal. That's not the same thing as a civilian trial. Um, yeah. Also, it is significantly more difficult to, to try people on the basis of terror connections when you don't know who they are. You just know that they were on the field in a civilian area shooting at you. It's actually very important that we not treat enemy combatants as, so, as prisoners of war. They're not the same thing. Prisoners of war and enemy combatants are not the same thing legally. The reason for that is that the Geneva Conventions were specifically designed to make people fight in uniform and try to force them away from civilian areas, right? That was the whole goal. The whole goal of the Geneva Convention is, if you're in uniform, we'll treat you as a, as a, as a soldier, and therefore you're entitled to certain rights under the Geneva Convention, and, including the idea that you're repatriated when the war is over, right? I mean, the, the Geneva Conventions are pretty clear about a lot of this stuff. The same thing is not true for people who explicitly disobey the other provisions of the Geneva Conventions. If you're out of uniform, if you're going into a civilian area, specifically making it so that civilians have to be murdered in order for us to capture you, you should not be treated with the same sort of care and loving kindness, because the fact is that we are trying to encourage you not to do that. So, you know, as far as the, the, the so-called you know, so rights of, of people who are gathering in civilian areas so that people have to be, you know, babies and women have to be killed, uh, in order for us to get them before they kill Americans, I don't have a lot of sympathy for that position. Thank you. Um, um, so I recently read Black Rednecks and White Liberals, mm -hmm. and um, I thought there were some really great points, uh, but I'm wondering if you completely buy the case that basically the redneck culture that moved to the South basically became black ghetto culture. Kind of yes, yeah, so that's the case. Tom, for those who haven't read the book, that's Thomas Sowell's case. So he's trying to explain why the rate of violence in black communities is much higher than the rate of violence <laughs> in white communities. And what he does is he says, look at the rates of violence among southern communities, white southern communities, versus the rates of violence among northern white communities. And then he actually traces it back to uh, actually their ancestors in Scotland, right? He says like there's a certain group of people in Scotland who sort of occupied the south, very different from the population that occupied the north. And it was much more of an honor culture. It was much more of a culture about defending yourself. So I buy some of it. I do. I buy, I buy a lot of it, actually. Um, to me, the, the reason that it has maintained and not gone down is it has, but first of all, the rates of southern white violence are still much higher than the rates of northern white violence. So there obviously is some truth to the, to the cultural argument. But, the, but on top of that is the fact that black communities for a long, and he makes this argument too, black communities for a very long time, uh, since really Jim Crow, have been under-policed. And so if, if communities are under police, then you end up with tribal, tribal revenge scenarios, right? This is true in every place from Afghanistan to Mexico City 
to black communities where, there, where there's no overarching police force, right? If somebody kills somebody in my family, my response is I'm gonna go kill somebody in your family, and then the response is I'm gonna kill, kill somebody in your family, right? You, you set up gangs specifically in order to defend your turf, and it becomes incredibly tribal. So one of the things that has to be done in order to correct this, there are really two main factors I think driving violence disproportionately in the black community. One is the disproportionate single motherhood rate. Boys need fathers. Uh, you need somebody to whoop your ass if you do something wrong. Uh, and mom won't do it. I mean, you can't do that if you're teenage. Any, there's not a teenage boy in the world afraid of his mother. It just doesn't work that way. Um, and, uh, and beyond that, uh, there needs to be much more policing. Uh, and law-abiding people in inner city communities know this because they actually would like to live in a place where people can come and build a business and invest and create jobs and break the cycle and provide tax dollars for the local schools and all the rest of it. So uh, you know, as far as the roots of it, I do buy some of the argument. You know, I'm not sure that it explains everything. Right. No, I think a lot of the, I, I think a lot of the, you know, there's a lot of parallels there's a lot of strange, in, yeah. in, in whatever, but I just can't figure out how like the, you know, the culture would permeate like that, you know, from two different kind of separate <laughs> cultures. Well, no, I mean, it could permeate if you, if you hold the people in bondage for, you know, uh, yeah. 200 years, yeah. uh, then they, they're going to tend, many, many of these people were born into a particular culture, which was a mashup of, you know, the home culture and also this southern white violent culture. That's essentially the argument that Sol is making. Yeah. You grew up in a culture. The slaves grew up in a culture, right? And that culture is shaped by the circumstances that surround them. So, I, so, I, so, you know, the, the, the reason that he's making this case, for those who missed it, is that there's a, the countervailing case is the one that's made by people on the alt-right, which actually is racist, right? Which is that black people are more prone to violence because of their race. That's a bunch of crap, right? Because the fact is that they're peaceful black people. There are plenty of peaceful black communities. Black people overachieve when they're put in charter schools. It's just, some of it is circumstance. Some of it is culture. Um, but to try and blame it on race itself, that actually, now you get into the realm of actual racism. All right, well, and then where he brought in, like, uh, I think, People coming from Jamaica who are black, who are basically outperforming. Yeah, hundred percent. There's, there's, there's there, a, not not right. Exactly. America likes to see people as black and white, yeah. but that's ignoring there's a massive amount of diversity among black folks, right? Just like there's a massive amount of diversity among white folks. Right. My my people are from like Lithuania, Russia. You know, a lot of people in Minnesota, their their ancestors are from the Netherlands and, and Sweden. You know, the idea that the idea that you're going that all of those are white people is just. It's silly. I mean, these these labels are too broad. One real quick thing. Um, do you have do you have a, sorry? Do you have a list of all the books that you recommend on your podcast? I need to, I need to have somebody go through and do it because yeah. it's because it, it's it's, it's now it's like 150 200 things. So yeah. Thanks. Hi, thanks for coming tonight. Sure. So in the week after the election, uh, I have a lot of friends who um, did or were at one point Bernie supporters, but ended up voting for Hillary and. I don't know how accurate this map is, but I've been seeing it reposted a lot about if millennials yeah. have an onto ignorance equation. Yes. And how blue the map was of how many people would have voted for Hillary and how she would have won the vote. She would have won like everything, right? Everything, yeah. yeah. So it's I mean, it really bothered me, and it's bothered me for a while because honestly, before I started listening to your podcast and Flavin's podcast, mm -hmm. I really been, I guess you could call it, closeted conservative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. My question is, does it worry you? I mean, seeing maps like that yes, of course in the next it, 10, 20, 30 years, um, and I guess what can I do so, personally to like talk to my friends yeah. and other people at, you know, to, you know just, I mean, to prevent a person like Bernie Sanders, who's so yeah. far left, that's all that we don't move in that direction. Right. So I think that, that so there, there's a lot to, there, there are a lot of things to unpack there. Um, the, the first thing, to say is that the reason that socialism is on the rise and the reason that, that kind of big government is on the upsurge uh, is because people need a cause to fight for. Young people particularly, they want to change the world. And they look at the status quo and they say, okay, what's a cause I can fight for? And it's very difficult for a lot of people to say, I'm gonna fight for a system that just gives me a better car. I'm gonna fight for a system that gives me a better shot at a job. Right? The big mistake Republicans have made typically is they don't talk in moral terms. My, this entire speech was in moral terms, right? I like to talk in moral terms because that's actually what appeals to people. Everybody thinks of politics in moral terms, they just don't want to admit it to themselves. They like to think that they just, they're looking for the best solution, it's not true. Right? People who like Bernie don't like Bernie because they think anything he's gonna do is gonna work because it's a bunch of crap, right? They, they like Bernie because he's saying there's injustice in the world and I alone can solve. Right? And, and people like Trump sort of do the same thing. Right? He does the I alone can solve routine, and people go, yeah, that sounds great. If you're part of a cause, that's better than being not part of a cause, and the left provides a moral cause that's actually immoral in my view. Uh, as far as what you can do personally to overcome that, two things. One is you can find people on the left who are actually willing to have open discussions, which you actually have to determine whether a conversation is worth it or not. Some conversations aren't. Some conversations are just people 
you know, wanting to mouth off and you're on your deathbed 30 years, you know, hopefully well, 70 years from now, you're, you're on your deathbed and you're thinking to yourself, my God, I wish I had those two hours on Facebook back because that was such a waste of time. Uh, and, and, you know, so you have to gauge whether that's a worthwhile conversation or not. Um, but if you have people who you can talk to, it's always worthwhile having those conversations and trying to convince them. Also, just be a good person. The better conservatives are as human beings, the harder it is for them to declare that we're, they're horrible. And once you actually break their, their, their self-proclaimed uh, monopoly on virtue, it's very difficult for them to deal with that. As far as millennials and, and how they're going to go, some, it's not quite as worrisome to me uh, for, for one reason, which is that as millennials get older, just like every other generation, they get more conservative. I am fearful that they're going to get less conservative as they get older because they've grown up in a, in a more left-leaning country. Uh, and also, uh, you know, this was one of my concerns with Trump, is that the groups that he is very unpopular with are the growing demographics in America, right? Women, minorities, young people, these are all the growing demographics in the country, right? He, he won a bare victory, right? He, he lost the popular vote. He won a very, very slim victory on the basis of a few tens of thousands of votes in Wisconsin and Ohio and Michigan uh, and, and Florida. And all of that victory can also be explained by the fact that no one showed up to vote for Hillary Clinton, right? A lot of your friends who voted for Bernie, they, they say they voted for Hillary. A lot of people didn't vote for Hillary, right? But Hillary Clinton, from 2012 to 2016, somewhere between four and five million Democrats did not show up. That's a massive number. Right? She, lost like, she lost 8 to 10% of the number of people who voted for Barack Obama. That's an amazing, amazing number. Right? And in 2008, since then, she's lost 7 to 8 million votes. So nobody showed up for Hillary. So looking at this like it's a brand new coalition and everything is swimmingly going to go on, it's, it's, just, it's not accurate. And so it's important that for the next four years, Donald Trump doesn't make an ass out of himself by saying he's going to grab women by the bleep and, and that he doesn't like Mexican judges and all the rest, right? because that alienates people, it turns out. Um, and so, you know, it's important for him not to do that. Will he do that? I don't know. Can anyone control him? Mm -hmm. you, know, <laughs> you know, you sort of hope that, that he goes back to being chained up in the basement like he was the last couple of weeks, and then Robot Trump takes the stump, and he just does that for four years. That'd be better. Um, but, you know, we'll have, to, we'll have to see what he does. Maybe, maybe, he'll, maybe he'll shock everyone and grow into the office. Uh, stranger things have happened. Not many, but stranger things have happened. So, but, but it is important that it, Republicans do for the next four years, at least the next two, before there's a congressional election, and I think they'll do well next time also because the, the map looks good for Republicans. Uh, for the next couple, four years, they have to do a really good job of promoting good policy, but also reaching out to millennials, reaching out to black people, reaching out to Hispanics, reaching out to women, uh, and that's going to require Trump to become something different than he's been, which is a little bit humble, and uh, we'll see if he's capable of that. Thank you. So, um... So as a, as a classical liberal, right, mm -hmm. as someone who believes in liberty, someone who uh, believes in facts and believes in individualism sure. and, and doesn't, doesn't hate conservatives, thinks <laughs> that conservatives are my ally, do you think there's any hope for people like me to have a reasonable conversation on actual ideas yes. uh, instead of just this name <coughs> to take back or at least push the left back into our camp and kind of get these neo-progressive crazies? At least, I, I, yeah. I mean, I, I do think I do, I do think there is. I mean, if I if I didn't think that, I wouldn't do what I do for a living. You know, I think that in the end, fact and moral and morality will will rise again. But I think you actually have to spout facts and morality, and staying calm and not getting super angry is, is a good way uh, is a good way of doing that. I also think that uh, as we move toward a conservative libertarian merger, which is really what's happening uh, in there's two ways of looking at Trumpism. One is that it's a big government conservatism. Uh, which is not really conservative. It's sort of a big government nationalist populism. The other way is that Trump really put social issues to the side, uh, and so there's sort of been a conservative libertarian merger. Uh, I would hope that it's more of a conservative libertarian merger, that, that basically conservatives say to libertarians, you guys are right, the government shouldn't be involved in anything, and libertarians say to conservatives, you guys are right, you do need a moral people in order to have liberty. If that sort of agreement can be made, then I do think that's a winning message. Because I, I, I think with most millennials, if you say to most millennials, look, stop being a nosy jerk, Right? You, my business is my business, your business is your business. I thought that was the purpose of, of, you know, you think that about sex and drugs, I think that about religion. Why don't we actually just get together on this? We can all do what we want to do. Let's leave each other alone. Stop being such, you know, stop being such a uh, uh, controlling freak. I think that people on the left understand that on a root level. I think that's why they, I think that's why so many, by the way, a lot of people on the left voted libertarian this time. Because they thought that's what Gary Johnson was. He isn't that. We actually had, in this election, a Democrat running as a Republican, a Democrat running as a Democrat, a Democrat running as a Libertarian, and a Democrat running as a Green Party member. Um, but, you know, that, but that said, yeah, it, I think there is a, a movement toward Libertarianism that, that could be appealing to a lot of people on the left who have, had the, uh, who have had the sort of moral superiority to say the conservatives are just about, you know, keeping gays in the closet and such.
Excellent. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm also a big fan. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. So, I guess several years ago, I remember a time when whenever you said something that was offensive, the worst you could be called is just like a jerk or an a-hole, or you'd just be regularly offensive. But now, all of a sudden, they label you with all these different keywords like racist, sexist, misogynist, all that stuff. And especially with the election, like even the mention of Trump's name was all of a sudden a keyword. So, yeah. like, where, like, what's the point of all of that? Like, why are they doing this? I mean, the, the reason they do that is because they don't want to have the conversation. So if they call you a racist, they no longer have to discuss with you. Or if they call me a racist, they no longer have to have a conversation. Why would you have a conversation with a racist? Right? Would you have a conversation with a guy in a KKK hood? No. That's why they say we're all members of the KKK, right? You and me, we're the two members of the KKK. <laughs> <laughs> The whole, the, the whole reason, it, it's very funny, the left is constantly talking about, you can't other people, right? You can't make people feel like the other. But that's what the left constantly does with the right. They're constantly saying, you guys are the other, right? You're racist, sexist, you're terrible people, so we don't have to have a conversation with you. That's the goal. And if you can get past that, then you can win the conversation. You can actually have a good discussion. But the first thing you have to do is take away the feeling of unearned moral superiority. And that means that the, the way to get past this is a very simple trick. When somebody says you're a racist without evidence, you say, no, you're an asshole. <laughs> really, this is a thing you should say. Because there is no excuse for calling somebody a racist without evidence. It's the worst thing you can call somebody in America. And if you do it without any evidence, this makes you a bad person. And so you have every, you're well within your rights to say that you are not allowed to throw slurs at people without any evidence that the slur is true. Because that's just a way to shut down conversation. That's the only, it's the only real comeback. Because if you start trying to discuss with them, you've already lost the argument, right? They say, you're a racist. And you go, no, let me explain why I'm not a racist. You're, it's, it's already over. The conversation's over because you're now saying to the person who called you a racist that they are a reasonable person with whom you can have a conversation. Therefore, it's reasonable to think that you might be a racist. Right? So you have to say, no, it's not reasonable to think I might be a racist. You're not a reasonable person. We're not having a conversation. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I, uh, I can't say I'm a big fan or anything, but I've seen you on YouTube a few times. Okay, well. <laughs> Give it, give it time, I'll grow on you. I think you're an intelligent and logical person. So, um, I am a relatively liberal leaning person. Uh, what do you think of the state of health care in the United States right now? And do you think Obamacare is working? And do you think single payer health care could work? And how do you feel about Trump? Right. Okay, so, so a lot obviously there too. Okay, so Obamacare is not working because Obamacare was designed to fail. Obamacare was designed to make health care more expensive so that, the, so that the left could put in place a single payer health care system. Right? Obama originally wanted a public option. He didn't get it because that was stonewalled, essentially. Right? So, they, so Obamacare was never designed to work. It's not working. When he says more people are on insurance, yes, it turns out when you put the government gun to people's heads and say you have to buy insurance or we will fine you, and if you don't pay the fine, you'll go to jail, people will do it. Right? It's like saying there's a government mandate to buy car insurance. Wow, suddenly everybody's got car insurance. If you mandate things from the government, more people do it. It's not effective because, again, you, if you like your doctor, you couldn't keep your doctor. If you like your insurer, you couldn't keep your insurer. More and more insurers are dropping out of Obamacare because the strictures are too much. So a lot of states only have one insurance company, if any, that are actually even offering the kind of plans that Obama wanted offered. Uh, most of the people, the vast majority of people, as, as late as the end of 2015, I think it was well over 90% of the people who had actually been added to the rolls were because of expansions to Medicaid, not because of Obamacare. So that was just more expansion of public spending, which is basically just the public option. Uh, as far as what needs to happen in healthcare, and would a single payer option work? So here's what single payer is good for, here's what it's bad for. Single payer is very bad for attracting new doctors because doctors don't get paid enough in single payer systems. This is why there are black markets in Israel and the UK and in Canada, right? Every place that has a single payer system, people come to America if they need a major surgery because it just doesn't work that way. It's good for emergency care because already we basically have, the truth is we already have basically a backdoor version of single payer for emergency care in the United States. If you don't have insurance, you just go to the ER and then we end up making the insurance company pay. My wife's a doctor, so they, 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 you know, they end up paying extra money, and the state ends up subsidizing, and people cover the cost. Right? If you, you cannot, it's against the law across the United States to refuse somebody care in an ER, whether they have insurance or not. So, you, so you're already, you do have a basic standard of sort of single payer already just because of those laws. The biggest problem in healthcare is not insurance. The biggest problem is under supply of medical care. Right? The problem and the way that you attract medical care is you actually allow the free market to operate. The reason doctor, you're not getting more doctors is because it takes a very long time to become a doctor. I know, my wife's still going through it, right? She's in residency right now. And it takes an awful lot of money. You have to invest in being a doctor. No one's going to invest 
you know, $200,000, $300,000 in becoming a doctor if they're going to get paid sixty grand on the other end. It doesn't work that way. It's why every doctor right now is trying to go into what they call the road, which is, which is radiology, ophthalmology, anesthesiology, dermatology. Right? Because those are all private, and because insurance doesn't cover a lot of those, it's all cash. So, so a lot of doctors are going into these things because the market works. So what you actually need is to remove a lot of regulations on health insurance, a lot of regulations on doctors, and make it easier <laughs> for people to actually go into the business of doctoring. I mean, some of the licensing requirements in order to diagnose a cold are silly. Like now that this is one thing that they're actually doing that's good. Nurse practitioners, if you go in and you want to get a diagnosis for a flu, you can have a nurse practitioner do it. That's good. Right? I mean, why should a doctor have to diagnose me with a cold? I can diagnose my daughter with a cold, right? Uh, but it's, but um, the only way to that you fix a supply and demand problem, just as far as supply and demand curve goes, is not to raise the demand. Obama just raised the demand without raising the supply. And so what's happening is that rationing is taking place, essentially. And so what you actually need to happen here is you need to remove a lot of the regulations. Best example possible is laser eye surgery. Laser eye surgery is entirely private, right? Nobody funds laser eye surgery. Insurance doesn't cover it. It's an optional surgery. Very few insurance companies cover laser eye surgery. It's almost entirely done on the basis of you walk in and you pay. When laser eye surgery started, each eye was $20,000. Today, you can get laser eye surgery for under three grand in most places. Why? Because every doctor who wanted to make money went into laser eye surgery, and they have 20 different options for laser eye surgery. The quality is better, and the care is better, and the cost is better. That's what happens in a free market. In a publicly regulated market, you end up with worse care, higher cost, and less of it. So you actually need to remove a lot of the regulations. And I, I hope that's what Trump does, although from what he's talking about, I don't see that happening. I mean, Trump, Trump just said this week that he wants to maintain the centerpiece of Obamacare, which is forcing insurance companies to cover people with pre-existing conditions. That's not insurance. Okay, take fire insurance. Nobody is, after you burn down your house, you can't go and buy fire insurance. After I'm sick, I can't go buy health insurance. That's not insurance anymore, now it's health care. What people should really be doing is buying catastrophic health care, right? Catastrophic health insurance, rather. You should be buying stuff for, like, you break your leg, you have hospital costs, you have cancer, you have hospital costs, right? It shouldn't be that every time you go to the doctor for any sort of care, like a cold, you have a $25 copay. You should just be able to pay your doctor cash for that. It's a silly thing. You're there for five minutes and you leave. All of that only happens in a freer market, not in a more restricted one. Thank you. Thanks so much. I think conservatives are at an inherent uh, disadvantage mm -hmm. because um, the arguments we make are primarily logical and there's not a, an emotional component to it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big part. One of the other question askers talked about um, the millennial map. And I think yes. that's a big part, as Dennis Prager puts, the age of feelings. It's so easy to make the argument you know, for same-sex marriage and say, yeah, love should conquer all. Like You can say that in a phrase. Right. Whereas the conservative argument, you have to whip out a 200-page book to, right. to you know, talk it through. Mm -hmm. So is it worth, for average people who don't have all this background of, of um, conservative ideas and all these persuasive things they can say, is it worth it to argue on an emotional level? Yes. Is it possible to do it as a conservative, or, or yes. should we do it the more logical It is. Way? No, no. You, you, should, you have to argue on the emotional level to get them out of the realm of emotion, then you can have a logical discussion. Right? This is why I say that what the left wants to do is assume moral superiority. When they say, all love should be rewarded and stuff like that, right? Then they're not arguing on a on a even a feelings level. They're arguing that it's a moral argument, right? They're they're arguing you're immoral because you don't agree with me here, right? Love trumps hate and all this kind of stuff. So the only way to come back with that is with a moral argument, right? You say something like, "Do you believe that? It, why would you want to deprive a child of the experience of having a mother and a father, right? Because that's really what marriage is about. And marriage isn't just about two people who love each other. I don't care who has sex with one another. I really don't." You know, what I care about is, is the children. That's what marriage was about. Marriage was an institution that was designed for the, child, for the bearing and rearing of children. And that's why the state originally got involved. Now, my belief is that the state should get completely out of the business of marriage entirely, because the state sucks at everything. They haven't been able to forward the institution of marriage, and now gay marriage is going to be used as a cudgel to beat religious people over the head, right? They're going to say, the state says gay marriage is okay. Why won't your church perform a gay marriage? We're taking away your tax exemption. Right? That's where this is going next. But the truth is that, that marriage was always a religious institution, mostly. And this argument would fall away if you took it out of the realm of government almost immediately. It really would, because, again, what the left wants is for the government to play God and confer dignity. This was Anthony Kennedy's argument. Right? When you say the government is not capable of conferring dignity to me or to you, it can't confer dignity to anyone, right? then, it's, then that's, that's, a, that's a moral argument. That's a moral argument. It's more likely to have an impact. Like When I say to people about gay marriage that I want the government out of it, you know, and 
me personally, like I'm a religious person. That means that when I got married, I had two different birth, I had two different uh, marriage certificates, right? I had the state marriage certificate, and then I had the Jewish one called the the the, the ketubah. And uh, and I only cared about the ketubah. I don't know where the the state one is. It's buried somewhere in our garage, I think. Um, but the, the ketubah hangs on our wall, and that's because that was an important document to me religiously. It meant that I was married before God, and then I could have sex with my wife. The state one didn't mean anything to me, right? I was married by the state like three months before the before the religious one, and that was a hard three months. So I was married. By the <laughs> so I'm much more. So, so the the idea being that if the argument on the left is privacy, okay, so let's make this whole thing private. Maybe make some different arguments, and, and they should be moral arguments first. And then once you make the moral argument, put them on the defensive. Explain. You say a child doesn't need a mother and a father. Okay, which one don't they need? The mother or the father? Is it just arbitrary? You just make it up. Why doesn't a, why doesn't a young boy deserve a father? Or alternatively, why isn't a young boy? Do you, which one? You're, you were probably born into a family with a mother and a father. Which one of your parents would you discard? Right? Which one of them was less important to you? Which one do you think you'd probably just replace and it'd be fine? The left doesn't have a lot of good answers to that because there's not a good answer to that. Yeah. I'd love to see you like package up those emotional arguments you can make so that. We yeah, can, I mean, we can make eight dollars a month and you can get it on the podcast. But yes. <laughs> So my question is, um, like Donald Trump's rhetoric uh, has uh, always been very like absolute, like oh we're gonna deport all the immigrants, uh, or illegal immigrants. Yeah. we're gonna you know do this, we're gonna do that, we're gonna repeal we Obamacare. We had no other choice. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, my question is, right, as he's sort of gone back on a lot of that stuff, mm -hmm. yeah, like just what can you foresee with the Donald Trump presidency? I mean, no one can foresee anyone anything. He's a, he's a uh, he's an inkblot. You know, what, what you see in him says more about you than it does about Trump. Because Trump has given a thousand different positions on every single issue. He's taken the Jeb Bush position on immigration. He's taken the Pat Buchanan position on immigration. He's taken the Ted Cruz position on immigration. He, he has more positions than the Kama Sutra. I mean, he's all over the place, right? And this is true on virtually every issue. The only one he hasn't shifted on is tariffs. He really likes tariffs for some odd reason. But, you know, beyond that, he's really, he has, it depends on the audience, right? If he's speaking in front of a business audience, he talks about how it's evil and terrible that the government is quashing you. And then when he talks in front of a bunch of blue collar workers in Ohio, he says, look at these evil business people who are offshoring. We need to regulate those businesses more. Right? So he gives a bunch of different messages to the same people or to different people, and he's all over the place. So that's why, really, in the end, the argument for Trump came down to at least he's not Hillary, which is a pretty good argument, admittedly. Um, but what, what you see in him is largely dependent on what you want to see in him. So what I've tried to do is, look, I think that he's, I don't think Donald Trump is a good person. I don't think Donald Trump is a philosophical conservative. I'm trying to put my own biases aside and say, let's wait and see, because that's all we can do. Everything else is speculation, right? And if I had to speculate, then I would speculate that he does a couple of good things, and then he does a bunch of things that I don't like, because that was his campaign. So, but it, maybe he'll surprise me. I'm not in the speculation business anymore. This election has put me out of the speculation business. So I don't know what he's going to do. Um, but neither does anybody else. So anybody else, and this is, this is where I, I had some real quarrels with people like Ingram and Hannity in the primaries who kept saying he's the most conservative conservative that was ever conservative. That's a lie, it's not true. Okay, and they, and they knew it wasn't true and they kept saying it over and over because they were Trump backers. And that I object to. Just be, what, what you should demand of every commentator, not just me, is to be truthful. And when we make a mistake, to say we made a mistake. Right, and to, and to give you our best, our, our best facts that are available to us, not what we wish, not what we wish cast Trump to be. And so I'm not wish-casting Trump. Maybe he'll be good. Maybe he'll be bad. I don't know yet. Right? And that's, that's all I can say about him. Uh, and one more question. My dad is a huge fan of you. Is it okay if I get a picture with you? Yeah, absolutely. We'll stick around. We'll do some pictures after that. <laughs> okay, I guess we're all done. Well, we can do, we can do like, why don't we do one? Were you were the last guy? Or did you already ask a question? I asked one. Okay, so why don't we have somebody else who didn't ask one come on up? All right, so after the election, uh, a lot of people who didn't agree with the uh, results with social media and tweeted the hashtag, uh, not my president. Yeah. Do you think that after the dust settles, this divide will kind of diminish or do you think it's going to increase? Uh, I think that it's going to remain pretty bad. I, I didn't see the divide, you know, decrease over the course of Obama's presidency. I don't expect it to decrease over the course of Trump's. Uh, and Trump is a much more bombastic figure than, than Obama is. Obama is a celebrity president, but Trump is, uh, is, a, is a very bombastic guy. So I can't imagine that he's not going to throw some, some bombs somewhere in here that actually stir the waters a little bit more. It is ironic that everybody was saying to Trump, are your followers going to accept the results of the election? And he, was, and he basically said, yeah, and nobody believed him. 
and uh, and then Hillary loses, and her followers are tweeting, "Not my president," right? Like Barack Obama was my president. It doesn't mean I liked him, right? I have relatives I don't like either, but he was in, but, but he, he was my president. That's the way the system works. I wish he'd been a better president. He wasn't. And Trump, who I didn't vote for, again, is my it, he's my president. I I pray and I hope, just as I pray and I hope that every president does a good job for the American people. Uh, it's it's bizarre of the left to play this game where he's not their president so long as so long as they lose, right? It's only, it only works if they win. That's why Trump talked about the Electoral College. I think there are actually some pretty good arguments for getting rid of the Electoral College. There's some bad arguments too. But I'm not going to listen to the arguments until the person making the argument is the person who won because of the Electoral College. <laughs> right? I'm not going to, like, when, when a person wins the popular vote and loses the Electoral College, and they were fine with the Electoral College until two minutes ago, then I'm, you know, then I have problems with their arguments. So the, the whole illegitimate president, he's not legitimate, he's not my guy. First of all, it, it's sort of like when people say that it, it's the it's the, the old the old kind of uh, the old kind of routine when people say they don't believe in God, right? God doesn't care, right? God the, 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 the God believes in you, right? Is the idea. Um, Trump doesn't care whether you think he's your president. Okay, if you decide to try and treat him as though he's not your president and disobey the law, there will be consequences for that because it turns out you live in the United States. So they can they can whine and, and scream as much as they want. I think they're looking really childish. And I think that all they're doing is driving more people into Trump's camp by looking this childish. Just like I think that, you know, that the protesters come protest me at, at these colleges. I think they're making more people uh, sympathetic to my positions by making themselves look foolish. Well, thanks so much. <laughs> if, you wanna, if, you wanna, if you wanna do a few pictures, why don't we do? We'll do it. You know, let's get a line going. Uh, and then we'll have, uh, you know, one person take the pictures and they'll be handed the cameras.